the guiding investment principles. So we kind of, we have broke a few down here. Supply and demand is what he talks about. He talks about being the governing uh, principle of everything in business. And that's exactly what you were saying. And a few other things that I s found interesting was he always bought existing properties. I think he was involved in, in a couple of development deals, but most of his portfolio was existing properties. He said, new construction development, there's just too many variables out of your control in development, right? Rates go up. I can tell you that uh, one right now. We're going through this right For now. Sure. That's, there, there's so much can change because a, a development is can be a, a two, three year horizon, right? Before the yeah. building stood up. So he talks about how why he didn't like development, preferred existing acquisitions, yeah. which is which is our business, right? Um, so you know, and a few other things was talked about a little bit, but you know, he, he always talked about what is your competition. Where there's no competition, there's better deals. So that's why he preferred smaller markets in his in the beginning stages. He while everyone was going flocking to Chicago and New York City and L.A. and buying properties, totally he was buying Ohio. stuff in Ohio. Yeah, he, he built a portfolio in Madison, Wisconsin. So yeah. he was finding these smaller markets because his thoughts was, if there's no competition, I can come in and scoop these deals up. And I don't care as much about, you know, declining population and all the stats going on because I know the deal's great. It's got a great cash on cash return. Yeah. And it's going to stay steady. That's, those were really like the the guiding principles I saw from his investment. So cash flow is the lifeblood of any business, right? If you have enough cash flow over and above your, um, your expenses and your debt service, you can, you know, uh, effectively weather any storms. And, um, and that's one thing that, you know, that, that we try to model, um, you know, our, our real estate business after is really buy, you know, our core business is buying, uh, deals that cash flow on day one and then trying to find, you know, value add levers that we can do to increase the value and, uh, you know, get force appreciation in the property. But if it's cash flowing and it's solid cash flow on day one, and we pair that with the right debt and the right management asset management strategy. Um, we feel really comfortable about those deals versus going out and saying, hey, we're going to go be developers. Um, I know Sam Zell talked about, you know, he's like, why would I go to, you know, Phoenix, Arizona or Atlanta, Georgia or Houston, Texas, where they just breed developers. Those people just want to, they, they don't, you know, they just want to stick a building wherever. It's the sexiest, you know, part of real estate being a developer and putting up an awesome new building. But there's just so many different var variables to to consider versus, hey, look, I've got this in-place cash flow. And if I do a few of these little things, um, you know, I can increase the net operating income, increase the cash flow, increase the value of the property, and then boom, have a have a nice, uh, you know, a great return. Yep, 100%. That's, that's our business, right? Um, one other thing I thought was super interesting was he talks a lot about identifying risk and that being the most important thing uh, when it comes to making a decision on the deal. So he... Talks about early on, he did some deals with Jay Pritzker. Uh, they did 10 to 15 deals together, he talks about. And he's, he alludes to that guy being the smartest risk mitigator he's ever seen. And one thing, he talked about a conversation he had with him, and um, Sam Zell was presenting a deal to Jay to do, and he was going through this long presentation of all the different factors in the deal. And Jay says, um, you know, point number six right there is what the deal is all about. That's where this deal breaks or works. And so that, that's what he talks about, is when you're looking at a deal, Figure out where your risk is, and if the if that risk were to kill the deal, you shouldn't do the deal. I 100% agree, and I talk about this all the time when we we when we look at deals. I mean, typically, you know, you know, obviously, I'm not a Sam Zell by any means. Um, I'd say Adam's a, a wizard uh, in 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 having this crazy intuition, but I really try to think about as much as possible. How do we manage the downside risk? How do we make sure that if everything goes, you know, if the business plan doesn't go according to plan, you know, shit is out of our control. How do we make sure that, uh, you know, it doesn't go belly up on us, right? Like, and I, I, I totally agree with that. I think that's that's the best way to evaluate any sort of uh, investment opportunity. There's things that you that you like about the deal, and then it's important, and and, and that's great to make sure you you there's certain aspects that, hey, we really love this about the deal. But then the more important thing is to figure out what 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 would you really hate about it? What could really go bad? What could do what's your downside? Exactly. Um, and that ties into decision making. So to me, he was a great decision maker. He, he says like a, a great businessman comes down to how quick can you make decisions. That, that's what identifies a great business person. And um, a couple notes on that too is he, he actually said decision making is what separates the men from the boys. And I thought that was a, a very interesting quote. Um, but he also talks about everyone that's involved in the decision-making process of a deal 
needs to have money in the deal. So if someone's involved in the deal, they don't have money in the deal, their incentives are aligned with yours because they're, they don't have a downside of yep. losing the money. So he talks about like the executives at his company, he always made them when they're working on big deals, a write a check into the deal yeah. because he knew if they had their own money in the deal, they'd be much more incentivized to make this deal work. How many times, I mean, even in this, this is episode 10 or something, right? We've talked about um, ensuring that incentives are aligned because ensuring that you're aligned uh, on, you know, not only like the whole deal, but just the vision, the goals, because if they're not, and one way to make sure that, that everything's aligned is that, hey, they've got skin in the game. And that's something that we, we, we talk about. You got to understand all the different players involved in a deal. You know, you know, the broker's primary um, goal, and I have friends, I'm friends with a ton of real estate brokers, but, but you know, the, their primary concern is, is getting a commission check. They want that deal to close. Yep. They're less, they're less concerned. I mean, the great ones are really concerned about your business plan and they want to make sure that you're successful because they see it as the long game and they want to do business with you over time. Potentially they can help you sell that, trade that building in the future. But, but really, and that's where you're trying to find the people that align with, with, uh, with your business plan as much as possible because, and, and then you go down the list and figure out, okay, well, this person or this group is involved because of this and, and, you know, so the more people that you can have that have skin in the game in these deals, the better. 100%. And he talks about, too, like building a, one of the keys, too, for him was building a great team. So he had, he was known for having employees that worked with him for 20 plus years. Yeah. They were with him his whole career. And he talks a lot about, um, you know, creating a great environment for people to work with you. But one, one story he would tell is he joked around that he, his office never had a door because the door was always open. And he created this environment that was very much he was easily accessible. I mean, at this time he's he's a very he's a very big CEO, yeah. right? And and uh, he he created this environment where anyone could just walk into his office and talk to him. Yeah. So I thought I thought that was interesting as when you really think about it, it's easy to say now when you're you know when you're in the building blocks of your business, yeah. like oh I'd always be there. But you build this massive empire and you're still just talking to whoever and kind of growing the business and being there as a mentor. And that kind of just speaks to him as a person too. I mean, he was he says he invented uh, business casual. He wears jeans to every every meeting right that's just his that's his style right and I think that's also the laid back style of you know I want to I'm I'm not above you guys because I can go buy a you know a ten thousand dollar suit and I wouldn't even notice it in my bank account right like he I got my door open I'm wearing jeans you know we're all aligned on on you know the goals and we're all trying to make money together and I think that's there's a lot of things that we I, I hate to you know we're that that I would say that we're trying to emulate with what 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 he does within our real estate business is how can we um, make sure that everybody's aligned on on interests? How can we have a great team that has full transparency with each other? We don't take things too seriously. I mean, I'm I'm dressed up now, but um, I can tell you, Adam's probably not. I know you're not. You know, Adam's probably got shorts on right now. Looks like he's golfing, but I um, and maybe he is. But uh, you know, it's it's. It's that sort of um, mentality that I think um, breeds the best teamwork and culture. And then teamwork and culture is going to beat, uh, you know, we're in football season now, right? Teamwork and culture is going to beat um, talent, you know, mm -hmm. so many times. So I, I think that's a great point to make too. Yep. And then so one last point here is, he talks about being an avid consumer of information. So one quote he said was, you can't be an entrepreneur if you aren't curious and consuming information. So he was known for, he talks about, I mean, he's old school. He'd read five newspapers a day, three magazines a week, and one and a half books every two weeks. So he was always consuming information. And one interesting story he, he talked about was he was reading in a newspaper or something about some small town in India, just opened up a Gucci store. And he'd never even heard of this town before. And he was like, how are they, you know, how are they opening up a Gucci store there? That, that, that signifies wealth, right? Yeah. So he hops in his plane, goes and visits the town right away, like the next day, and sees what's going on. And, of course, invests in this, in this country or city and, you know, kills it. So it's like always consuming information and taking action quick was one of, one of his traits. Um, because, you know, he says the more information you consume, the better you can become at decision making. If you have an idea of what's going on in the world, and that allows you to mitigate risk and make decisions quick. So I thought that was, and he also talks about he would travel 1,000 hours per year in his plane because he always wanted to see things in person, meet people in person, instead of just 
you know, he'd read about it, of course, but then as soon as he saw an opportunity, he would make sure that he yes. saw an actual one person. Yeah. Which I think is is kind of a dying trait, right? Is the convenience factor of doing things online, Google For Maps sure. or a Zoom call with someone, of course, makes things easier. But I think at the end of the day, nothing beats physically going out and, and walking a property or walking a new market. Meeting, meeting investors, someone in person. meeting clients, meeting people in person. Uh, the relationship goes that much further, right? You can really get a sense for um, you know, how it's going to be working with that person. And I think, I mean, the, being a voracious reader and, and consumer of information, y you hear it from everybody. You hear it from Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. You hear it from Mark Cuban. These people just read, read, read all day, and they're always trying to consume information, whether it's newspapers, you know, books, um, you know, whether it's not nowadays Twitter. I mean, you're getting real-time information right away or X, whatever you want to call it, right? Like, um, there's so many ways to do that. And I think it's just having a conscious effort to always be uh, trying to stay ahead of the curve on whatever it is that you're interested in, in, in business and in life. And I think um, by doing that, you're able, to, like you said, you're able to make better decisions faster because you're, you're, you're ahead of the curve on that. 100%. Um, all right, so last part of this, a couple of quotes that I just pulled out uh, that, that he would mention. Uh, you call them Samisms, right, is, is I think what he alluded to. One I thought was super interesting, not, to, not a detailed one, but he would always say, tell me about your deals. Yeah. So he, he's known for being a really brash person. He'd like walk straight into a room, right, and like someone would be asking about something, and he would just say, tell me about your deals, because he was trying to figure out like, what sort of deals is this person doing, how yeah. are they performing? So he'd always ask that quite, what I think is a super cool Super like straight to the point question, but I almost laughed like when he talks about it because it's just super brash. Like, tell me about your deals. Exactly. <laughs> you want to know what what someone's working on and how you know how it's going. How well? I mean, you can evaluate so many things by asking somebody about their deals, right? You can you can evaluate, um, you know how you know how well that person knows what they're working on, right? How well that person, uh, how you know how how do they think through getting into that deal? What 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 an exit strategy would be, what, you know, do they know their numbers? Like, how's it performing right now? You can get so much by asking sort of an open-ended question. And that's in anything in business, right? Tell me about what you're working on. You know, what's 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 going right, what's not. I think I love that, and I'm going to incorporate more of that myself. Yeah. And then on that topic, too, another quote he would talk about was, in his early days in investing, right, I was talking about how he wasn't, like, super educated on real estate investing. He just kind of was, was doing it. Um his approach to analyzing a deal was take the bottom line and multiply it by six, and that's the price I'll pay for the property. So you mentioned like he would go on, he'd be talking about a deal, and he'd pretty much just say straight up, take the bottom line, multiply it by six, that's what I'll pay. And, uh, you know, th that that kind of became the guiding principle, right, of like cap rates and kind of analysis of deals. But um, I, th I thought that was interesting because, of course, like when you get into further deals, like you have to do a detailed underwriting spreadsheet. Like I, I do a lot of that, right? But I think the more I see people that have been doing real estate for 30 years and that are huge players in the space, they do do that component, but they're more so they can walk a property and just get a general idea on their head and back of the napkin be like, this property's worth X dollars, right? And it's like, then I'll spend 10 hours in a spreadsheet underwriting and it's like, yeah, it's same same number I got, right? So it's something I think you you grow into, right? As you can just kind of sure. look at something and say that's what the property's worth. For sure. One quote that he had too that I, it's not not even on here. This is your your doc, but um, he said something about um, every day you own an asset in your portfolio, you're choosing to buy it, right? Like you're essentially it's you're you're owning that. You could sell it right now if if you want to get out of that deal, and that's I think it's a it's an interesting way to look at it. Um, now some some a lot of properties you're. Uh, within real estate specifically, you're performing a business plan to add value to it, um, but you, you have choices, right? So like you, it's it's an active choice to continue owning what you have, and and that's because you might like the future prospects of it, or if you don't, you can make a choice to 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 move on. Yep. And I thought that was an interesting quote from him too. Yeah, I like that. He also says on the topic of numbers, he said one thought he always would say is we suffer from knowing the numbers because he always had a pulse on what properties were worth and what you could pay for a property for it to work. And he sent that out to, you know, his his close group of of, of investors that he knew that that he, that he thought highly of because he knew like we know the numbers and in times where people were overpaying for properties, they weren't doing deals, right? They were they were at a halt yep. and they they kind of felt like, Oh, why are we sitting here not growing? 
but we suffered from knowing the numbers. He knew that it wasn't the right time to do a deal yep. and halted halted acquisitions. Um, another story on top that I'm recalling is in, uh, before the uh, the big um, dot-com boom, right? So that was like early 2000s, I think, when, when the market crashed and all. Yep. So he, one of his, talks about one of his buddies called him and says, how do you feel like, you know, you spent the past 30 years working to become a billionaire and there's all these tech people becoming billionaires overnight. And he says, he says something along the lines of, um, when it turns to cash, call me. Yeah. Pretty much like all of these billionaires, right, are, are just, their inflated stock prices are what's causing, yeah. causing it while well, he was sitting on, crash. he had the cash, right? He was yeah. a legit billionaire backed by strong assets yeah. and there was the crash, right? So it's just another, it's just super interesting, right? The the grave dancer, he just always saw what was coming and just, it, it, it's it's insane. He's the really. goat. It's, the it's insane. No doubt. Um, last quote I want to talk about was he talked about, um, getting involved in new businesses and this podcast listening to, they asked him like, why did you always like stick with your core competencies of real estate? And of course he's involved in some other businesses, but he says, if I can't run the business, I don't want to own it, which I think is very, so he said like, if I'm going to get involved in some crazy, like tech venture or biotech or whatever, like, I don't know that business. And I want to only be involved in businesses that if I had to step in and take over the entire business that I understand what it is and how to run it. Yeah. So I think it's, it's as, as you grow in business, right. I, and, and you start to see more shiny objects of like, Oh, I can get involved in this and make this for him. It was like, no, I'm staying focused on what I know and I'm growing in the land that I know. Absolutely. Say so I said it before. I'll say it again. He's the goat. That's uh that's a wrap on Sam Zell. Looking forward to doing some more of these, um, deep dive bios on people that we love. So, and that we respect in business. So that's it. Thanks for listening to episode 11, where we went through Sam Zell's life and some of the key takeaways. This was a great exercise for me, uh, really just going deep and studying someone that's achieved massive success in the space that we're, that we're in. I think it's a great exercise to go through on your, on your own, right? Whatever business you're involved, find someone that killed it in that space and study them because you'll learn so much and you can essentially follow the blueprint they laid out. Some of the biggest takeaways I had from doing this was always be consuming information. Um, and when it comes to investment principles, what is your competition? Invest in markets and places that there isn't as much competition. Risk. Focus on what your downside risk is in a deal and really hammer that out and make sure the deal works if that point falls. Um, as well as decision making. Uh, decision making is what separates the men from the boys. I thought that was a great quote from him. And building a great team. As you scale, build a team that's going to align with your goals uh, and create more growth. So thank you for listening. Thank you.